morning and welcome to our virtual worship service at First Presbyterian. Immediately following our outdoor drive-in service, we will enjoy a brown bread lunch together in the parking lot in the shade. If you are in town watching the virtual worship service, please feel free to come and join us around 12 o'clock noon. Spring has definitely sprung and we are planning a Presbyterian planting party to plant some more flowers around the church. If you would like to be a part of this effort and enjoy some fellowship, please let me know and we will plan a date in the near future. I know that it does not come as a news flash to anyone that mainline churches are facing challenging times. Nevertheless, we will continue our work and to run the good race, as the saying goes. But it is hard not to sometimes think, in addition to our valuable mission work, just what are we supposed to do? Until last year's pandemic began, we spent many Wednesday nights together reading and studying the brilliance of theologians, both ancient and contemporary. Hopefully, we will be able to resume that practice soon. In the meantime, I still read about and listen to many fascinating theologians online and recently came across the words of Welsh theologian and poet Rowan Williams, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury until 2012. His words so well encapsulate the responsibility that we who embrace being a part of a vital church have before us. Bishop Williams posed this question. Where does belief in God even start for a lot of folks? It starts from a sense that we believe in, in other words, we trust certain kinds of people. We observe them and think, the way that they live is the way I want to live. The world they inhabit is one I'd like to live in. Now this puts quite a responsibility on believing people, of course. We must make God credible to the world. We must occupy a certain place in the world, a place where others can somehow connect with God through us. This is not with any sense that we are exceptionally holy or virtuous, but simply because, as Bishop William says, we agree to take responsibility for God's believability. The sentence, the way they live is, the way I want to live, stands out to me. It represents how I would hope that people looking at First Presbyterian would view our perspectives and values and the action we put behind those perspectives in order to serve Christ. The other thing that stands out is the world responsibility. It is our action, our missions, that often make the indelible impression on people. May it be so that we can strive each day to live this way at First Presbyterian. And what an opportunity what a gift, what a privilege to be part of such a church. And now, let us be called together to worship. Hear this call to worship from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us and his faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let us do just that as we come to worship this morning. Let us praise the Lord. Oh 
This is that moment in time that we can step away from the clamor of life and attune our spirits to the divine. Stilling our thoughts and concentrating on our breath, let us release anxiety or worry. Let us think of our oneness, our relationship with God, a connection of love, wisdom, and peace. Breathing in and breathing out. We affirm this connection prepared and ready to worship. We fool ourselves if we think that our ways are hidden from God. Therefore, let us confess our sin. Let us trust in the mercy of God, our maker, to forgive us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God, you are everlasting, the creator of all that is. Your understanding is beyond measure. We confess to you that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. In your compassion, forgive us, for we place our hope in your steadfast love. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our God heals the brokenhearted. He binds up our wounds. God takes pleasure in those who place their trust in God's grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please join me in today's unison reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
Let us pray. Holy God, speak to us what has been told from the beginning, your word that is the foundation of the world. Amen. From God's word today, we will be reading from Isaiah chapter 40. We will read verses 21 to 31. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I did it again. As I typed out my sermon title, Fly Like an Eagle, I immediately started to sing the song by the Steve Miller Band of the same name. For those of you who may not know, the refrain says, I want to fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to fly like an eagle till I'm free, O Lord, through the revolution. Eagles are one of those things that have always intrigued me, but my dad really loved eagles. I don't necessarily know why, but from eagle statues in the garden to eagle pictures on the wall, I think next to God, his family, and the fighting Illini, eagles were one of the things that my dad loved the most. It may be that his love of eagles was partially because this portion of scripture was particularly meaningful to him. Since his death, every time I see an eagle, I smile and I think of him. Now, my dad was not the only one for whom eagles were important. Our country uses the eagle as one of its symbols. Eagles are mentioned almost 30 times in the new revised standard version of the Bible. Here in our neck of the woods, we can head right on down the road to Gulf State Park and we can even check out some nesting eagles there. Did you know that young eagles can fly hundreds of miles a day and that eagle eyesight is at least three to four times better, possibly up to 10 times better than human eyesight? They can fly at speeds of upwards of 100 miles an hour, and they can reach elevations of 10 to 15,000 feet or more. But one of the most beautiful things about eagles is watching them soar on the wind currents, something they can do for hours at a time. It's no wonder people have heard this scripture often and held on to it. 
to be able to take the sky like an eagle and float above the world on the wind is a powerful image. I can remember when I was young, and even a few times as I have gotten older, having a dream that I was soaring above the world, floating on the wind, and watching everything happen below me from afar. I can still feel that sense of freedom that I felt in those dreams. And this is probably the kind of freedom that the Steve Miller Band wanted as they sang. Now the final verses of this chapter in Isaiah naturally fill the reader with hope. And that is good. But I think it's important to understand why it was that the Israelites needed this hope in particular, at this particular time in Israel's history, and how a word for them then can also be a word for us now. Last week, we talked about how the first part of Isaiah coincided with the later times of the kings of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel, headquartered in Samaria, had already fallen, and the southern kingdom of Judah was on its last legs. Chapter 39 in Isaiah relates the story of Hezekiah and how he was told by the prophet that his pride in showing off the riches of his kingdom would lead to Judah's downfall. Between chapters 39 and 40, there is a lengthy intermission somewhere in the vicinity of 50 years. During that time, Jerusalem fell and the people of Israel were led into exile in Babylon. Everything they knew changed. Their temple was destroyed. Their religious practices had to be adapted to a new location and a new normal within a new kingdom, which didn't worship the God of Israel. No longer were they inhabitants of the land of promise. No longer were they led by their own kings. All because they no longer remained faithful to the covenant to serve God alone. And then a new word came. A word of comfort. Chapter 40 begins with comfort. O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The exile was coming to an end. Yet, What that end looked like isn't what God chose to tell the people right off the bat. Instead, God decided to remind the people who God was. God spoke through the prophet words that were meant to call to Israel's collective remembrance, the sovereignty of the God of Israel. In fact, for the majority of this chapter, This chapter that began with this idea of comfort, the majority of it, comfort is not what is contained therein. Out of 31 verses, only five really speak to this idea of comfort. The rest of them speak of who God is. God is creator and wind shepherd and ruler, the one who prepares the way, the one who causes humanity to rise and fall, and the one who is more than any idol or any human could possibly be. Now for a people who have been in exile and have likely forgotten who they were in relationship to God, none of this seems too comforting. In fact, these people have in some ways given up on God, questioning whether or not God even sees them anymore, feeling as if they had been completely 
just disregarded by God? Is it really comforting to hear about this sovereign God who has done all these great things when you're wondering why God hasn't done anything great for you lately? Never mind the fact that it was the actions of the people that led them to this place where they now found themselves. Never mind that they were told over and over that disobedience to the covenant would bring the consequence of exile from the land. It's been almost 50 years, what we would consider nearly two generations since the exile began. So many who were there at the start are no longer living. And there are those who have never known life outside of exile. The stories of God's rescue from Egypt and subsequent interventions in the life of God's people are just that, stories. And they no longer have that first-hand experience of who God is. And yet, this is where it had to begin again. The people had to once again learn who their God was, even if they had to take it on faith. To hear words of comfort and promise would have meant nothing if the words came from someone whose identity and character was unknown. Up to this point, it may have felt like God was simply a God of judgment, and they were the ones who had been judged. However, God wanted to remind them that judgment is only a portion of God's identity. God is also creator, love, and rescue. Judgment is not God's final word. Restoration is is. God is powerful and compassionate. After all this time in exile, it was hard for the people to sustain their hope that one day it would come to an end. After all, humans are really good at selective memory. We remember what we want to remember. And when sitting in exile, it was probably very easy to remember the judgment that had brought them there. The comfort promised at the start of the chapter could only be comforting in the context of a renewed vision of who God was. And once that was established, then the words of comfort could be heard clearly in order to bring hope to the people for the future. The return from exile would be hard and long. It would take over 100 years for all of the people to return to the land from which they had been taken. As such, it would be necessary for the people to hope. The young people might be old before they saw the land with their own eyes. There would be stumbles and falls as they made their way back. So to know what God would not only restore them to the land, but God would also give them strength for the journey would have been of vital importance. They would need to be those who waited on, who hoped in, who expectantly looked for God. And when they did that, They would receive from God what they needed in order to persevere. They would be given strength for the journey. They would be lifted up when they fell, given endurance when they were exhausted, and would feel the freedom of an eagle in flight when they had felt weighted down by what they saw around them. The idea of renewed strength here could be thought of as a complete change of clothes, or maybe even better, a battery replacement. It's not just a recharge of an existing battery, but the actual removal of the old battery and insertion of the new. And this new battery is God's inexhaustible nature 
that has now been transferred to those who wait on and hope in the Lord. This is kind of like the promise from Matthew that we read a little earlier. Our heavy yoke is removed and replaced with the easy and light yoke of Christ. While it's been a few thousand years since these words were spoken to the Israelites in exile, not much has changed. We are still a people who, especially in the midst of suffering and hardship, can forget who God is, and as such forget who and whose we are. We find ourselves questioning God's presence and God's power. We say that we know God is sovereign, but we really don't want to believe that God is sovereign because we don't want to not understand why things are happening the way they are. Now, unlike the Israelites who were in exile for a reason, I'm not suggesting that all the hardships we face are some kind of punishment from God's hand. What I am suggesting is that instead of focusing in on the struggles and the heartaches that we often hold on to and remember well, we train ourselves to remember who God is by recounting all that God has done from the beginning to show love and compassion to God's people. Because when we remember who God is, we are enabled to wait for, hope in, and look expectantly for the ways in which God will provide the strength, the hope, and the freedom to believe the truth of God's promises and persevere when we stumble and fall. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May it be so. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith from the Scots Confession. We confess and acknowledge one God alone, to whom alone we must cleave, whom alone we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom alone we put our trust, who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance and yet distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence for such end as his eternal wisdom, goodness, and justice have appointed, and to the manifestation of his glory. Please pray with me. God of the universe, you sit above the circle of the earth, and so we pray for the oceans and mountains, inland water and the air we breathe. Save and protect them, we pray. Since the beginning of our faith, we have looked to you to gather the outcasts, heal the brokenhearted, and bind up their wounds. So we pray for the poor of the world, the sick and the lonely. God, you build up Jerusalem, and so we pray for our country, for all the countries of the world and for all of our leaders. May we all come to see that your delight is not in the strength of the military, but in those who hope in your steadfast love. How good it is to sing praises to you, O God. We pray for your church, here and around the world. 
Empower us to go from town to town, proclaiming the message of Christ. Everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, we bless you for you are gracious through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us now give thanks to God as we give our tithes and offerings. Pray with me the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. We sing to you, God, with thanksgiving, making melody to you with our praise. Use these gifts to spread your gospel near and far for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast at the table of God. They will come from north and from south, from east and from west to sit at table in God's kingdom. According to Luke, when our risen Lord sat at table with his disciples, he took the bread, he blessed it and he broke it. And when he gave it to them, their eyes were opened and they saw who he was. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all who believe in him to share in this feast. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our praise. Almighty Father, creator and sustainer of life, your majesty and power, your continued blessings and your great goodness fills us with wonder. We are unworthy of the pardon you have in mercy given. We can bring only our thanks, putting our trust in your Son who alone saves us from evil. Therefore, enjoy with prophets, apostles, martyrs, and saints of every time and place we join in giving you praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of glory, in thanks we remember how Jesus broke the bread and gave the cup to make us partakers of his body and blood so that he might live in us and we in him. God of mercy, in thanks we remember now how Jesus invites us to this table. Imprint on our hearts his sacrifice on the cross. In gratitude, we bow before the righteous one, declaring his resurrection and glory and knowing that his prayers alone make us worthy to partake of this spiritual meal. Believing Christ's promise of eternal life, we live in him and declare Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that as we receive bread and wine, we may be assured that Christ's promise in these signs will be fulfilled. Eternal Father, lift our hearts and minds on high, where with Christ, your only Son, and with the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours now and forevermore. Amen. Let us now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to take your bread, the bread of heaven. And now, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
as we go into the world, strengthened by the food we have eaten at this table and the word that we have ingested from God. Be watchful. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and strong. Let all that you do be done in love. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.